uh, 73 specifically and 74 and onward, uh, we have a phenomenon called stagflation where you have a really high raise in prices, inflation, uh, but you also have people that uh, don't have a lot of jobs. Great Depression was the opposite. You had deflation where everything became worth very little and then uh, uh, or, or the prices were very low, so they had to cut jobs and, and it made sense. This is going to be a, a different one. So uh, we probably won't finish this today, but uh, we'll make this list probably tomorrow when we finish the notes up. Well, I'm going to tell you about some factors that caused inflation to be rising from like the 1930s uh, all the way to 1973 and the uh, factors that caused unemployment in the same era. Uh, I want to focus on this one real quick because one of them is definitely the oil crisis of 1973. My dad actually lived with this one, so uh, he does remember. He was a kid, but uh, he does remember what this was like uh, during this oil crisis. So, at the time, in the 70s, almost all the world oil came from uh, the Middle East, the Persian Gulf region. Uh, it still is a huge source. But back then, they didn't really have very uh, well-developed uh, oiling sites in Northern Europe or Russia or the United States and Canada like they do now in Alaska. Well, that's the United States, but... So it was pretty much coming from almost exclusively uh, these um, OPEC nations, and of course the uh, Arab ones in it, um, O A P E C, uh, the, uh, of course the uh, Arab uh, Petroleum Exporting Countries, Organization of Arab, Arab Controlling, uh, Petroleum Exporting Countries. Uh, the Arab ones in 1973 specifically stopped selling their oil, which again is pretty much the only source of oil or the major, the biggest one in the world at the time. Uh, to the United States and a bunch of countries in Western Europe and others. Why though, if you guys remember from the Jigsaw, do you remember why they would do this? They all of a sudden for about six months, they stopped selling oil completely to the US and, and some of its allies. The US and its allies are supporting Israel. Exactly. Uh, Arab, uh, Muslim states in the Middle East, which are usually majority Arab, uh, detest the existence of, of Israel. Uh, have, arguing that they replaced the Palestinians that were there, and, and you can you know, decide who you support on that or not. Regardless, the Arabs do not support it, and uh, we were supporters of Israel along with Western Europe, especially after World War II, after the whole Holocaust. Uh, people were much more willing to allow uh, Jews to settle in a state in Israel. So we supported them militaristically, and the Arabs got upset that we supported them against a war versus Israel. In 1973, Yom Kippur War, a bunch of Arab states invaded Israel, on their holiday, uh, and they were defeated by Israel because of, of course, all the equipment and support they had from the U.S. and the West. Uh, and as a way to sort of give the U.S. the middle finger and all the other uh, uh, countries that aided Israel, they enacted an oil embargo. Oil embargo. Uh, for six months. I think it was November or October from 73 to about March of 74. And um, what happened was the supply of oil in the West, which they really depended on for everyday life, uh, dropped ex extremely. Like, it was a substantial drop in supply. And you guys know what happens if your supply drops, but your demand is still the same, roughly. What happens? The price is going to go way up, right. So, very quickly, in the West, you have, it depends on the region, but you have roughly, in a six-month period, a 400-plus percent uh, increase in gas prices. So first of all, people are upset that it costs more. But second of all, there's just not enough to go around. I have some pictures here. Um, I'm sure you all have driven uh, at this age, or you've definitely ridden with people. Uh, and you go to a gas station, you see there's a bunch of people like, ah, screw it, I'll get it later, I'll go to a different one, right? You've had that experience before, yeah. I'm assuming. We have some big ones here that don't really fill up, but I mean, you've probably experienced that somewhere. Imagine this though, no matter where you go, and no matter what time, except maybe like 3 a.m., if the gas stations that are even open, there's a line that goes all the way around the block, sometimes for miles, to get gas. Costly. Yeah, but worse than that, like that's, uh, that does happen, I've seen that. Um, I used to get gas there when I uh, went to Costco in, uh, in Manteca when I lived here. But yeah, so that line is nothing compared to the lines. I have some pictures, like I said, of like, uh, I know you think of the Costco line where they have a lot of pumps and then sometimes cars line up, like four or five cars at each, and it's like, oh, that sucks, that takes a long time. That was nothing compared to this oil crisis. Every gas station, if it even had oil, or, or sorry, gas, to uh, provide, uh, they would go for, for uh, potentially like one to two miles depending on uh, the location and time of day. 
just to get gas. And then sometimes you'd wait there in line for an hour, and then they'd run out, and you wouldn't get any, you'd have to go wait somewhere else. Uh, even more of a problem was people siphoning gas, obviously, because there was so little and the prices uh, went up so quickly. So I, I remember my dad telling me that during that crisis and just after it, people wouldn't, were not able to park in the street because you, know, you just had your gas siphoned, it was automatic. So you'd have to like park all your vehicles that had gas in the garage, or you'd have to like park them up against like your fence or wall so that like there's no room that they could stick anything in there to, to funnel the, uh, the gas out. Uh, it, was, it was pretty crazy. Um, so why would this though, I mean that, that, that's all terrible for the individual people, um, but why would this cause inflation? It's just one thing, it's just oil. Why, why does it raise all prices? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm using. It, that's in your cost of production. It doesn't matter what the product is. It has to be run by a power plant that's powered by coal or oil. Uh, you're gonna use petroleum in the, or oil in the actual production uh, facility, whether it's to lubricate the machinery or run machinery, and you gotta transport the good. So this is gonna raise the cost of production uh, for everything, and uh, that's gonna contribute to inflation. So that's just one factor of many that caused a uh, substantial rise in inflation in 1973. So let's get this slide about the oil embargo, and we'll do the other two or three that are left tomorrow. We're basically taking like two and a half days to explain one single slide. Uh, but it's a, it's a complex one. Okay, here's the last bit I'm going to tell you about stagflation, and then we'll be like, this is stagflation, because we already have all of the causal factors. And then we'll briefly talk about how some people in the 80s thought they could fix it, but they don't actually get to employ their plan. So, the new left. You're like, why the hell are we talking about politics in uh, economics class? It's only brief. We the door for you. Thank you. The new left is a movement in the 1960s and 70s, and this is, this is like US history, world history stuff, so I'm not gonna focus too much on it. Let me just, tell you this. You guys all know the civil rights movement, right, from US history, I hope? I, they taught you one thing, I hope they got at least that far, okay. Uh, that's what this largely is. It's the movement in the 60s and 70s, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, educated middle class people uh, that are tired of systematic discrimination. What I mean by that is like actual laws that forbid you from doing things based on your race or gender or, or whatever, right? So uh, what you guys saw in the jigsaw were some results of this movement. So again, this is a social movement, a very necessary one, by the way, uh, to rid the U.S. of uh, uh, institutional, meaning like laws from the government, uh, discrimination. Now, it doesn't make it illegal to have racist or sexist views, obviously, but it does make it illegal to actually act on them and deny people jobs uh, or pay them less or deny them the right to vote, things like that, just because of their skin or gender or religion or, or whatever. All right, uh, and again, a very, very necessary movement, very beneficial one, which I'll, which I'll mention here in a second, but there is at least one short-term consequence here economically, which I'll, which I'll, I'll go over. So this uh, did several things. We had the Civil Rights Act, which again was in your jigsaw. And uh, I think you guys probably at least remember hearing about that in your US history, I hope. Again, like I said, I hope your teachers got that far at least. That's where, well actually you tell me, what is it? What, what did the Civil Rights Act do? It's a lot of things, but just as far as economics go, what did it do? What did it do for people? I actually already said it too, by the way. Allow everybody to work. What's ahead, man? There it is. <laughs> Allow everybody to work. Well, Who's everybody? What do you mean a lot of work? They weren't allowed to work? As in literally everybody without any, uh, you know, uh, what's that word? Discrimination? Discrimination against, okay. you know, the person or the race, wherever they come from and whatnot. Yeah, those are immutable characteristics, by the way. Those are like the color of my skin, my gender, mm -hmm. things like that. You can't change those. Um, so, well, I mean, you can alter them, I suppose. But, like, if you are what you are, as you're born, you can't like be, decide not to uh, have a different color skin or, or, or different sexual organs and things like that. Um, now we have surgery for things like that, but regardless, you shouldn't ever exclude somebody just based on those uh, characteristics. And that's what this makes illegal. So in this case, I cannot deny any employment. I cannot uh, discriminate against somebody like, you know, not giving them not giving them a house because they're uh, a certain color or, or, or gender or whatever. So employment, 
uh, business discrimination is uh, officially legal after this one. Okay. There's two more that were on the jigsaw that are going to allow either more people in or protect people from being discriminated against. Do you remember any other ones? Equal pay act. Yeah, Equal Pay Act of 1963. 1963. What does that one do? It doesn't um, allow like companies to pay women less than women. Exactly. So uh, no pay discrimination based on the, those immutable characteristics. All right. So you can't just pay a woman less because she's a woman, or technically a man uh, just because he's a man for whatever job. It's got to be merit based, based on their either experience or competency at the job, uh, not their their gender. Okay. So that made it illegal a long time ago. Wait a second. I heard that women get paid less. I heard they get 77 cents on the dollar for every dollar a man gets. How is that possible? Anybody ever heard this? Yeah. It's really common. Okay. Um, so, because I know a lot of people, when they hear about this act, they're like, wait a second, what? It's been illegal for how many years that is? Almost 60 years. Um, I thought that women made less than men. Uh, that's actually way more nuanced than you think. So again, here's the stat. One dollar a man makes, uh, a woman makes 77 cents, as in they make less. Uh, the reason why this is inaccurate, it's, well, it's accurate, the statistics is accurate, but it, you're, you're not looking into the numbers here. This is just the average for all women and men incomes uh, per year. Uh, or per hour or, or however, however the pay is broken down. It doesn't look at the actual jobs or how many hours are worked. So that's where the big uh, breaker is. And if you look at the average amount of hours worked uh, at whatever job between men and women, uh, men on average work more hours, uh, usually because women choose to work less because they'd rather uh, do other things besides work. Um, you've got men for whatever reason are more likely to work longer than women, not because they're tougher or harder or anything like that, but women just for whatever reason choose to spend less time at work and more time with family and friends uh, than actually uh, uh, working. And here's, here's a good example of this, by the way. If you look at a specific industry, uh, like um, I think it's the, uh, the busing service in the Northeast, it's illegal to pay, everyone is paid the exact same, just like teachers are. It just depends on how many years you've been doing it. So it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl, it doesn't matter uh, if you're even a better bus driver or teacher, you just, You've worked this many years, you get this pay. That's exactly what it is for everybody. But when you look at it, the men make more than the women every year in that job, even though it's illegal to pay them more. It's, it's just a pay scale based on year, right? It's like, oh, in year one, you make uh, 50,000. I'm making the number up, obviously. Year two, you make 52,000, all the way down. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female. How are men making more than women at that job? The bus drivers, usually the men are the ones who work at the yeah, they work more overtime. That's all, all, it, all it breaks down to, is uh, the men are, are more willing to take uh, a shift on short notice, and they're more work, willing to work overtime, which is, you know, voluntary. Uh, it's not that the women are earning less money uh, in a wage, it's just that they, uh, for whatever reason, uh, choose to work less. So that's just a personal choice, and uh, there's no right answer here, like, uh, should men be doing this or should women be doing this? It, it's not really relevant. What's happened with the reason why this occurs, though, largely is because of that difference in, uh, in hours worked. And again, that doesn't mean men are superior workers or, or anything like that. That just means for whatever reason, if you look at all the millions of men working, they prefer to work more, uh, spend more time at work, and women tend to prefer more time uh, at home. But hey, that doesn't mean every man and woman thinks that. You guys know that. There's plenty of guys that don't like to work overtime, and there's plenty of women that would rather be at work and work overtime. Uh, and you see them across the world too. I'm talking about when you put all the millions of people together, that's what, that's what occurs. So individually, it could be whatever. It could be an 80 hour work week chick, she works all the way up till she can't work anymore, she just, that's her, and then there's the guy that does, doesn't wanna work at all or just works part time. You have those examples, but uh, we're talking when you look at all the millions and put all the numbers together. Does that make sense? All right, so yeah, you are protected, men and women, uh, from being paid less or more just based on your gender. And if you ever hear that statistic, just know that that statistic does not consider the actual jobs that they're working. It does not consider the actual hours they work um, and, and several other factors. It also doesn't consider how, more, how much more likely a, a guy is 
to leave his job or fight for a raise, uh, leave his job for better pay, like move far away, uh, or uh, try to negotiate for a higher wage. So those are all little factors that aren't included. Uh, but just know, if you ever feel like you're actually being paid less because of your gender, uh, it's actually illegal. So it's a, it's a very serious uh, offense. Anyways, there's one more too. One more uh, change in the 60s is going to greatly reduce some racial discrimination that was added in the 1920s during the height of the eugenics movement, back when they thought Northern and Western Europeans were genetically superior. At least some people did. It changed something about who's coming into the country. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see a hand there. It's like an immigration act that like, got rid of discrimination against immigrants. Yeah, how? Do you, does anyone remember how it got rid of discrimination like uh, against? Like it didn't matter about their background or their race. Yes. There we go. Immigration uh, and Nationality Act 1965. What that did is it got rid of the old national origins formula. Um, I'm not going to go too, too much in depth to this, but basically, they, in 1921 or 23, I can't remember what year exactly, in the 1920s, they made a law about immigration that said you can only accept 2% of the nationalities that are foreign born in the country at that time. I know that's really complex, but they did that specifically in 1890 because that was a year when a lot of the foreign born people in the United States were uh, Northern and Western European and all of the other regions of the world were, were uh, low at that time. So they specifically set immigration to that. So that meant that from 1923 or so to 1965, uh, almost all immigrants were um, Northern or Western European, and that immigrant groups like uh, um, Asians, um, Southern and Eastern Europeans, uh, who else? Africans. Uh, and to a lesser extent, Latin Americans, although I think for some reason that theirs were uh, relatively uh, similar, that those amount of immigrants were kept super low and these ones were kept uh, uh, to be high. 1965, they get rid of that formula, that randomly chosen formula that tried to get Northern Europeans and Western Europeans to keep other people out. They got rid of it. So it kind of opened the floodgates. Uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, by the way, but it kind of opened the floodgates so we had a whole mass of new immigrants coming in uh, from Asia, from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, from Africa, uh, and from uh, Latin America. All right, so that opens it up. So I describe all these things to you guys, just obviously to show that's part of this movement, trying to get rid of discrimination in the government, in laws, and they do a good job of that. Um, and that's wonderful. This, the reason why this is wonderful is you can no longer discriminate based on these factors, and we've got a whole bunch of people coming in. So what this means is people looking for jobs from 1965 on, uh, we're going to get more people that are um, uh, intelligent or motivated or uh, hardworking. We get a lot of new people from these groups uh, that we did not have in the workforce before. That is a positive on the long term, obviously. We want uh, women and minorities and immigrants that come in that are skilled, talented, motivated, uh, hard work ethics. There's hundreds of thousands of them. They enter the workforce, that's good in the long term. Excellent in the long term. How might this be bad in the short term though? Does anybody know that? This is the one that kind of caught people off guard and surprised them. Because this is definitely a long term good, but there's at least one short term downside uh, to this floodgate of uh, people entering the workforce. Crime. Not crime, actually. That's not going to be the issue because, uh, I mean, these people are already here uh, and immigrants, so far as I know, legal immigrants, I don't think that they're very well known for, for crimes because basically if you're an immigrant, you kind of have like a waiting period and if you do commit a crime, you're out. So if anything, they're usually on better behavior. Um, what would uh, be a short-term consequence here, like a negative one? What you got? There it is, that's exactly right, yes. What we do is we have a temporary decade-ish law, maybe a little less than a decade. No, that's about a decade. Um, we have a temporary, so again, this is short term, guys. Don't, don't misinterpret this as me saying, this was terrible because it caused unemployment. No, it was just a short term blemish, but I mean, five to 10 years when you're in it can seem very long and uh, discouraging. So it's a short term con, I guess you would say, was a massive uh, increase in workers. And again, like you mentioned, the problem is 
Are there enough jobs for uh, several hundred thousand people to roll in all of a sudden? Not yet. No, not yet. Exactly. That's the key is not yet. Uh, that you need, there needs to be time to adjust to that. But we do temporarily have a, uh, a temporary spike in unemployment. Now again, it's going to be worth it in the long run because these are valuable uh, employees and workers and they have good ideas. But for that short five to ten year adjustment period when the economy has to respond and, and, and grow those jobs, it's going to be very frustrating for people who lose their jobs uh, or um, are not able to get as much money as they want because there are so many people unemployed. By the way, why if, let's say I already had a job and this didn't affect me, like I already have my job as a teacher or whatever. Um, how could the presence of a bunch of other workers that don't have jobs make my job actually a little worse, <clears throat> at least in, the law, in, in, that, in that short five to 10 year period? How could it actually harm me if I'm already working? The money that is already going around has to be spread out more to pay new workers. What do you mean by that? Well, let's pretend that the jobs don't change because it's not like I can magically create jobs for these people. So they come in, right? I could get laid off. Certainly, but I'm going to pretend that I'm not even being laid off. Let's say I still keep my job the whole time. How could the presence of all these workers out there who are unemployed make it harder for me uh, as a worker? You're kind of close, maybe. Because if you want to get better conditions, then you just fire your entire team. Yeah, exactly right. If I got a huge pool of people waiting for jobs and I want to, like, you know, negotiate for better wages with a strike or something like that, are they going to allow me to do that? Why wouldn't my employers be willing to uh, bargain with me? Yeah, there's a, uh, right, yeah, they can just hire any of these uh, new groups that are ready and waiting, right? And that does cause a little uh, stir of animosity and in, in, uh, anti-immigration, anti, I guess you could say anti-change uh, because of that. It's kind of understandable. It's not realistic because in the long term, again, good thing. But in the short term, it can be hard to negotiate wages. Um, and then there's less jobs available just in general because there's so many people uh, that are ready to take these jobs. Okay, so that is the short-term consequence. So I think we now have all the factors uh, for uh, actually telling you what stagflation is. So let me just erase these for a second. I'll let you get the slide after I, I continue with this explanation. So I do want to show it really quickly anyway on a, on a graph what this might look like. So this is uh, the entire market. This is like a, a macro view. Here's the price, average price for any good or all goods. And this is the quantity sold. No, I'm going to do employment first, my bad. This is quantity, I actually didn't have to erase that. And this is wages, no. Jobs available? Sure, jobs. No, this would be wages. There we go. Uh, what happens here, so again, the demand here is uh, uh, businesses looking for jobs or job openings. And then the supply is, of course, my available workers looking for work, people looking for work. If all of a sudden I get a huge flux of uh, immigrants and minorities and women uh, coming to the workforce, again, a long-term benefit, but in the short term, what happens to this uh, supply curve of workers? You guys know this from earlier in the chapter when you have a change in demand or supply. What happens to this graph or this, this uh, supply curve? If I get a huge increase, <coughs> what? Yeah, it shifts. Which way does it shift? To the right. Shifts to the right, exactly. So that whole curve is going to move this way. All right? And that's, of course, going to, uh, in the long run, reduce the amount of jobs available relative to how many people uh, are available for work. So it does increase unemployment. And like you guys mentioned, it's really hard to negotiate for better wages if somebody can just take your spot. So what happens is, in the 1970s, we have a situation that we uh, that's referred to as stagflation. So stagflation. So maybe this might help uh, Julia remember what this means because she's asked me like five times what this thing is. Stagflation, 1973. Uh, I don't really know an exact endpoint. We'll just say late 1970s, early 1980s. This was a unique period in time when we had very high inflation on prices, and we had uh, very high unemployment. And a third thing, which sucks, what happens with, with employee wages? Do they go up, down, or generally stay the same? 
they generally stay the same, right? Because you can't negotiate for higher wages. And we have flat wages. I'll say flat, make it look like negative here. Flat wages. So it basically sucks for anybody in the United States that isn't ultra wealthy and doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, it sucks for all middle class and uh, the lower uh, economic classes in the United States, which is most people, by the way. Uh, so again, like I mentioned yesterday, if I got $50,000 in savings and I have a bunch of inflation occur and my wages don't go up, all of a sudden that $50,000 is worth less. I just lost money even though I did nothing wrong. Uh, so this is why people get so upset. So uh, no one knew what to do with this situation because there was no real clear answer. We'll talk next week about what they did to actually kind of fix it. Uh, but no one knew what to do because you had lots of things called causing inflation, inflationary mechanisms. Let's, uh, let's actually list them. Unemployment mechanisms. We've talked about several factors that cause inflation. Um, for Morgan Bucks, can anybody give me some that we've already discussed? Things that cause prices to go up. That's a weird sound. I wasn't ready for that. For what? Okay, yeah, yeah. Beforehand, uh, when unions were powerful in the 30s and 40s, uh, you had um, uh, wage, you said wage increase? Yeah. Yeah. Cost. Wage increases. Yep. And there's two reasons for that. Why were there, why well, you just <coughs> one? Unions was one in the 30s and 40s. What's another reason why I had some wages go up? It's actually uh, price controls here I'm talking about, at least earlier on in the late 30s and early 40s. What are some price controls that caused prices to go up? Price what? Yeah, exactly. Minimum wage. Okay. That definitely going to increase uh, uh, cost of production, which increases inflation. What else could increase inflation or the cost of production? Isn't it like the rarity of the item? The rare, yeah, scarcity. Okay, cool. That's an excellent example. What was one item that became very scarce for a short period of time? The price went way up on it. Oil. Yeah, exactly. So you got scarcity as a factor. Scarcity. Uh, and one, one example was the oil crisis. That caused uh, the cost of production to go up quite a bit temporarily with 400% plus increases in oil prices. What else? There's some other ones. Someone mentioned taxes. You mentioned taxes. Uh, you're correct. Give me some reasons why, though, taxes, specifically, like, why did the government need to increase taxes? There were several new things the government had paid for. Military funding. Military funding for the Cold War. Absolutely. I think that's the biggest one single factor. Military funding for the Cold War. Yep, the new social programs, right? In both of these social programs, you know a specific set of programs maybe you can give me? Um, social Security. Yeah, part of the Great Society program. Nice, Great Society. All right, and then you, Cold War was a very expensive series of proxy conflicts. Uh, and both of these, arguably necessary to some extent, but um, they nonetheless cost uh, money and require increase in taxes and cost production. One more factor for taxes, does anybody remember? This one's definitely the smallest, but uh, it's another form of government telling a company what to do and making it more expensive for them to operate. Environmental there you go. Environmental regulations, like with the what? Like certain chemicals can't be used? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Banning certain chemicals, making use a more expensive alternative, recycling, but what new organizations starting to make uh, regulations regarding those things and enforce the them? Environmental yep, there you go, EPA. All right, and then the last biggest factor was in, in increasing inflation. It's not a tax thing. Gold standard. Yep, getting rid of the gold standard, right. The uh, gold standard uh, elimination, we'll just say elimination. Makes it sound like a I'm going to play Overwatch or something. All right. Does anybody play Overwatch anymore? Is that game gone? No, it's yeah. still alive. It's still there? Okay. Still there. They're making a second one. They're making a second one? Like an yeah, expansion or an Overwatch 2? No, it's still Rush 2. It's, it's, same, it's the same thing. It's just they just want your graphics. money again. All right. All right. Fair enough. I love I loved, I loved to play Far, man. Anyways. So. I think we, I'm like thinking of all the things. I have old highlight reels too. Every once in a while I look at them. It's pretty fun. Um. <laughs> Let's think. Let's try to actually stay focused. And this is me I'm talking to. Uh, oh, uh, well, unemployment mechanisms. What are some things that are causing there to be a lot more unemployed people? Making it hard to uh, 
negotiate for wages. Um, minimum wage. Okay. Um, yeah, that does actually contribute to unemployment as well. So uh, price floors from earlier. Excellent. Minimum wage. Cool, cool. What else? Maybe. Immigration. Yeah, exactly. So you got a whole new uh, influx of immigrants. Why? All of a sudden in the 60s and 70s. Um, wasn't it because of the Cold War or something like that? Oh, no, it wasn't because of the Cold War. Yeah, I'll still give you credit for getting it. I think it was like the National Origin something. Yeah, they got rid of the National Origins Act, right. So the Immigration Act, Act um, 1965. That's going to be hard for you guys to remember, I can tell. Okay. Two more uh, new groups that are coming in protected uh, to the uh, to the economy. Again, a good thing in the long run, just a short-term is issue. Um, like women are allowed to have the same kind of job as men. Yep, cool. So we've got the influx of women to the workforce. How is that called unemployment? Oh, uh, just because it increases the amount of available employees. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like people all of a sudden lose jobs, but it does mean that these women coming in add to the amount of people looking for jobs and make it harder to negotiate for wages. Women in the workforce, immigrants in workforce, well, that they already, they already were, but this, this means that this implies that a larger amount come in. Okay, uh, and then we had the uh, Equal Pay Act, an example of uh, their protection, encouraging them to come in. All right, they also have more time too. We didn't talk about it. Uh, women had more time because generally speaking before the 50s and 60s, um, being a quote unquote stay at home mom was actually a full time job, like to actually uh, prepare food or keep the house or clothes clean. It actually legitimately took six to eight hours. But after the invention of household appliances like um, washing machines and dishwashers and ovens and microwaves, uh, that got reduced to about two to three hours a day and vacuums got reduced by a lot. So you basically had a lot of uh, uh, women who would stay at home and it would take them the whole day to do that stuff. Now they're done, you know, before 10 a.m. And so they're like, well, now what am I going to do? So they would go out and find uh, part-time or full-time jobs uh, as a result. So that was a good thing, too. Uh, what else? The Civil Rights Act. Yep, Civil Rights Act. How's that do it? Uh, because more people were able to get jobs. Exactly. Minorities in the workforce, more of them anyway. And again, Civil Rights Act. That. Cool. All right, this is so many factors, uh, but all these factors, this is why it was such a complicated issue, um, caused these to occur. High inflation, high unemployment, and then uh, that's of course gonna lead to flat wages because you can't negotiate for a wage if there's 20 people waiting to take your spot. All right, and that's the way it works. And again, this is temporary, but it sucks when you're in it because your money loses value, you're not sure about if you're gonna get a job or uh, if you're gonna lose your job because you know you can, um, and, or if you're these, uh, in this group, it's, it's hard to go out and find a job because there aren't many available. Uh, and it's a very, very difficult time. They try Keynesian spending, and if you forgot what that was, they try creating like government jobs to stimulate growth, but it doesn't work because the prices keep going up. So even if I pay you money, it doesn't matter. There's not much you can afford because inflation uh, keeps occurring. Uh, and there's too many people that are unemployed for it to matter. So it does not work. And after the break, we'll talk about uh, what they think they can try to do about it. So let's get these slides and then we'll take a break.